Good morning. What a good morning already, right? Super proud of Billy. I love that. I love just the, um, the readiness to respond. And um, just so proud of him and the work that he's doing there in a place where uh, all this sort of danger is exposed, right? And we, um, I think sometimes it's in the midst of these moments where we get almost a clearer picture of what reality is like. Um, and how we as a church, as God's people, are to respond. Um, we've been going through the book of 1 John, and um, if you have your Bible, you can turn there to 1 John chapter 4. But last week, we talked about this idea of what is at the essence of all of this, and um, how John just so masterfully captures that. He, he captures who God is in one word, and then he captures sort of our life in the Spirit in two words. Um, he says that God is love. He uses this word agape, this unconditional sacrificial love. This is God's very nature. It's right at the heart of who God is. And then he has this beautiful little phrase that I'm going to probably butcher because my Greek is not so good. But when he talks about us, he says agape toi agapeo. I think I got it right the first time. <laughs> it means beloved, let us love. And you can hear there's almost a, a sort of alliteration to that phrase that would have been intentional for him. He's expressing those two words to capture for us the essence of who we are and how we are to live. That God is this unconditional love and that we are the beloved, that we respond by taking that in, that you are the beloved, and then responding by pouring out that love. Let us love. Let us love the way that God loved us. And we're told that God first loved us, and then we respond in kind. We talked about this last week as like a, a breath cycle of an inhale and an exhale. And I had Raya come up and lead us through that kind of practice of taking deeper, more full breaths that uh, as we go through this life of following Christ, we learn to breathe even deeper of that grace of God. We never get to the place where we can sustain on our own. We always live in this place of dependency on that spirit of God to fill us and then for us to give it, to breathe it, that we can't just simply hold it in, right, or we'll suffocate. We, we breathe it in and then we breathe it out. And today we're going to talk about the opposite of that, that when we're living right, we're in this place of an abiding, intimate relationship of love. But what does it feel like when we don't have that? Which is an interesting question, isn't it? I think sometimes we don't even realize. I, I think about like during COVID where we'd put those little oxygen things on your finger and it'd tell you, oh, wow, you know, this is your oxygen level. You don't even know. You don't even know if you're taking shallow breaths. I think every once in a while I'm like reading in bed at night and I go, ah, right? Because I'm holding my breath as I read and you're like, what? what in the world? But this paying attention to when I'm not breathing John's going to describe this in one word, and he's going to say it's fear. That on one side you have love, which is to be dwelling in proper relationship with God, receiving and giving. The opposite of it, when we're out of that relationship, the texture of it is fear. And fear can take kind of a lot of different forms. I think kind of at its lightest is like worry or stress. Most of us live there day in and day out, don't we? We can almost dwell in that place of fear where it becomes normal, it becomes rote. It's the, the things that are going on in the back of our mind when we're not even paying attention. And how that can go from being stressed to being overwhelmed. Some of you have felt overwhelmed recently, I know, because I've talked with you. Life can be pretty overwhelming. When we see calamity, it can be pretty overwhelming. It reveals something to us that's often shocking to us because the truth is most of us live life with a fair level of comfort where we get anxious when we hit traffic and these kind of things, right? Which isn't real suffering. Let me just make that clear that uh, we, we act as if it is, right? Like, oh, traffic, I'm suffering. And, and then you see what's going on in the rest of the world, right? And realize, oh my goodness, how good we have it. 
And when we see something like war, I think we see part of the nature of man revealed, the brokenness of the world, honestly seen for what it is. And there's a, a wonderful essay that C.S. Lewis wrote to his students that um, is called Learning in, in Wartime. And he wrote this in like 1939, I think, as like World War II was starting. And he had all these students that were there learning poetry and mathematics and all of this and realizing like, what are we doing? What are we doing studying these things? There's a war going on. Shouldn't we stop everything? And I thought I would just read this one line from there where Lewis writes this. He says, the war creates no absolutely new situation. It, it simply aggravates the permanent human situation so that we can no longer ignore it. Human life has always been lived on the edge of a precipice. Human culture has always had to exist under the shadow of something infinitely more important than itself. If men had postponed the search for knowledge and beauty until they were secure, the search would never have begun. We are mistaken when we compare war with normal life. Life has never been normal. And this is the truth. I think sometimes when we look back, we imagine a world that like everything was fine and everything was working and, you know, but that's probably more nostalgia than anything. That there's always things going on, calamities, suffering, problems that we're wrestling with and struggling with. And the question becomes, how do we navigate through those times? Do we get pulled into fear? Or can we somehow operate in this place of love? This is what John is talking about. How to live and abide in this place of love, even in the midst of a world that's swirling with chaos. And so often we're saying, God, if you could just take the problems away, then I would have peace. But God is saying again and again, when you're living rightly, you're operating within that world. When you are receiving that love, you're then pouring that love onto those who are suffering and in need. And we become like the first responders. We should go in and do what we can do. And too easily, I think we, we fall back into this place of self-protection. I um, confession when I was real young, I was afraid of the dark. Was anybody else here? Just, okay, a couple of you. No, I would sleep under my blanket, right? Because that was safe. I mean, talk about the most ridiculous thing to keep you safe, right? Like if there's some murderer going to come in, if you pull your blanket over, you're safe. You're like, you're a sitting duck, right? Like, it's the last thing you should do. I want to see that guy when he's coming in. But no, like that blanket made me feel safe, and I would be underneath there all sweaty and too hot, but, but safe, right? And I think what would have happened, you know, if, if somebody came in there and just tried to take that cover away from me, I'd be like, what are you doing, right? This is my security. This is my protection. If I can pull this over my head, I'm all right. And we need to grow out of those little ways of self-protection, don't we? But, um, but too often we figured out something that we believe works. It feels secure. What we want to do is just stay underneath that duvet, stay underneath that blanket, and I'm all right. But this is not the kind of safety that God is asking that from us, not the kind that turns away from the suffering of the world. That love has a sort of courage, it recognizes the vulnerability around it. It doesn't hide from it, it goes towards it. Realizes that God is there in the margins, God is there in those places of vulnerability. And I think as I get older, you know, I, I still have these fears that come up and, and often they'll show themselves in, in my dreams. I, I still have that one of like, I've got a final that I've never showed up once to that class, but I've got to take it anyway. Does anybody have that one? <laughs> that dream is horrible. And I've probably had it like 50 times. There is that nice moment of relief where you wake up and you're like, oh, that's not the case. But that feeling, right, is too much. My other weird one, I've told you this before, but I'll have a dream that my teeth are falling out. That one's horrible. <laughs> Anybody have that one or just me? Okay, Rick, yeah, thank you. I'm not alone. These, these ways that like the fear in me gets revealed. And a lot of times I wanna say, you know what, I'm not afraid. I'm confident, my beliefs are intact. 
But there's these sort of tells underneath that say, oh, Jeff, you're worried. You're worried. All of us probably are in some way living in that sort of place. And it doesn't take much to expose those things. I always think about this like surfing, that I'm not ever thinking of sharks until my foot bumps something and then I'm like, shark, right? Like, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's not, at least not yet. But, um, but I think sometimes we, we feel like we're at peace and that fear is just like one little thing behind us. One little news story that we see and like, oh, and, and let's be honest, we've been living in the last couple of years where it's like week after week after week, there's these sort of jarring things where... All of a sudden, our fears awaken, where that duvet cover is pulled down, right? And the fear is revealed. And John is speaking right into that. He's saying, I want you to know this kind of love so deep within you that our response is not a fearful response, but in this place of deep trust. And I think this takes work. It's a work that God is doing in us. It's part of why God allows the difficulties in our life is to awaken us to a deeper sense of reality that in a world there is trouble, but to take heart because God has overcome the world. I'm going to take this passage in kind of two sections. We're going to do it first uh, 11 through 16. Let me read these verses for us. John says this, beloved, there's that word again, beloved, John knew this, right? When he writes in his gospel, he refers to himself as the beloved disciple. And he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and this love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him. He is in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. If you want to know that you're safe, right, it's, that's where it's found not in hiding and not in withdrawing, not in self-protection. It's found in this place of living in this intimacy with God, allowing ourselves to be seen in all our brokenness, in all our frailty. I love that prayer of the man where Jesus, he's asking for the healing of his child and Jesus says, if you believe, he'll be healed. And the man says, I do believe, help my unbelief. And that's probably most of our hearts, isn't it? I do believe, help my unbelief. I do love, help my fear. And that in this place, this is the work when it says that he, by living in that place, is perfecting us. What he's doing is removing the fear and replacing it with love. And the church should be this place where that is felt. This is the vision that you should want. I talk about the church needs to be a safe place to heal and a brave space to grow, that we would become like Christ for the sake of others. And this is kind of our purpose and our mission. And I think it's important for us to realize that church often for many doesn't feel safe. It doesn't feel like it's an okay place to walk in, broken or limping, struggling, and it needs to be that us doing the work is part of what makes it safe for others to do the work. We're all in this process together. That God is doing this work of perfecting our hearts so that we can love like he loves, so that people can see God. Isn't that interesting? That's what John is saying, that people, people don't see God, they see you. So if people are going to understand Jesus, you got to be Jesus. A friend of mine just who's like on the fringes, like looking in at Christianity and hungry, but like just filled with questions. I wrote a blog about this sort of love overcoming fear. And he said, I want to post that. I want to post that so that my friends could read it. But would you be offended if I cut the name Jesus out of it? Because 
if I do that, they won't read it. And I was thinking, oh gosh, let that sink in for a second. But if Jesus, if that name doesn't feel safe, it's because we haven't done a good job of representing that love. Because the effect that Jesus had, right? Everybody had a place at his table. I think it was a table that you wish you were sitting at, right? Except it's like all the low life sitting there too. All the people that you're like, do I want to hang out with those guys? And Jesus is like, yeah, come sit down. <laughs> or the little kids that are just an annoyance, right? And we don't have time for them. And they, they come right up to Jesus, right? Because he's just going like, oh, no, no, no. Come, come. That sort of love that invites and draws in. That's our job now. That if people are looking for God and what they see is us, when they see us, do they see Christ? Do we do honor to that name? Do we represent that love? And John's been giving a series of tests. These are how you test if somebody is in or out. But what is he saying here? He, he's talking about a way that we sort of lie to ourselves and say we're in when we're not. And what he means by that is he's going, people that are claiming to be in the light, but there's this massive tell that exposes that they don't really believe what they say they believe. And that tell is that they don't love others. I mean, this is such a convicting book, isn't it? Like, do you want to know if you're in the light? I want to be in the light. Okay, this is how you know. Are you loving others? No. Then you're probably not in the light. And this being in the light, realize this. This is like in this place of life giving. It's not this like in or out, like sorry. It's God saying, no, no, no. If you want to receive this love, you have to live in this place of abiding with me. And to be there, it, it's simple. It's just this sort of humble like help me, right? God, have mercy. It's not earning that place. It's not like looking a certain way. It's this place of humility and dependence. And as followers of Christ, we never get to leave that place. We never earn the right to be self-sustaining in our love. We're always in that place of receiving and receiving and receiving, but then giving and giving and giving. And couldn't God just change this? Couldn't he just make us sort of once and for all self-sufficient? And, and the truth is he couldn't because that wouldn't be loving. That God is going, I want you to know and experience not just love, but like deep intimacy. That's God's heart for you. That's the kind of love that brings joy. That's the kind of love that is life-giving. And you know people like this, right? I, I think, I like how Lewis says he's not one of them, but he's starting to recognize these people that are just sort of filled with this life and this love of God, where it just spills out of them wherever they go. And Jesus is saying that's what it means to be alive. That's what abundance feels like. And to be in this school of God's love, right? I, somebody posted these, you know, you get all these little silly memes going around, but this one was like, rate my professor statements about Jesus. Like if you're in his class, you know, like he always wears sandals every day. It's these kind of things, right? But talking about his like kind of weird grading system, right? Like some people just show up like on the last day and they get the same grade as everybody else. What's the deal with this class and the way Jesus grades? And yet his expectations, he demands perfection. And it's really hard to go from an A minus to an A plus in Jesus's class. And I, I say that just because I thought it was clever and silly, but there is some of that here where there's this just entering in humility, living in this place of grace, and then realizing that we have a teacher who's saying, oh, but let's be clear, I'm, what I'm after in you is perfection. What I'm after in you is a purity of heart. There's work to be done. This love of God is wildly generous and yet at the same time holds very high standards, higher standards than we're probably comfortable with. In verse 17, it says, by this, love, by this is love perfected with us, 
so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. John has been saying that again and again, hasn't he? Almost every passage we come to, he reaffirms this. Loving God means loving others. It just does. And to be in this place of receiving love, we see is the absence of fear. In fact, that love, as he says, casts out fear. And I can imagine some of you could use a little bit more of that love today, right? As that fear, that worry, or the stress or anxiety builds up. This is part of what we do when we pray. As we turn towards God, we receive that love and we let it cast out the fear. And he says something interesting here, and I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole, but he says fear, that understanding of fear, is really a distortion in who we understand God to be. So he's saying God is love. God is not punishing. Isn't that interesting? And we go, well, okay, but, but certainly there are consequences for our behaviors, and this is true. And certainly there is suffering in this world that God allows, probably more than we're even comfortable with. So what does that mean when he says fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love? And see, I think this is one of the distortions sometimes that lingers in our understanding of who God is. I think what John is kind of pointing us to is a distinction, maybe a, a, there's adding clarity, some nuance to this understanding of fear of God that, that we're told again and again throughout Scripture to fear God, which means a sort of reverence and respect, even a sobriety of the power of God. But the punishment, I think that sometimes what we see and we attribute to God, and a lot of this is through distortions or even struggles with our own fathers, a whole bunch of reasons is that we see God as retributive. If you don't give God what he wants, then he's going to punish you. And John's saying, oh, no, 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 that's not God. That's not how he works. The God does allow discipline and he'll do that to bring us to repentance. He'll do that to refine our hearts. That suffering is, in a sense, good for us. But this idea of this condemnation that comes down, or retribution, this isn't who God is. And how do we know this? Well, we know this by looking at the cross. We're like, well, what amounts to justice? How does God make good? How does God restore this world? And he goes, I do that by taking that all upon myself. That's the vastness of God's love. The fat sacrifice that says, yes, there's a cost, and for there to be justice, there's consequence, there's payment. There's more debt than we could ever repay, so who is going to make this right? And Jesus says, I will. And he takes that all upon himself and sets that right. That picture of God's love, this is what we dwell on during Lent as we think about God's heart revealed to us. That sort of love that initiates. And we love because God first loved us. It's just a response to that love. And to receive it requires humility. It requires acceptance. It requires this... Um, seeing ourselves in the light, exposed for all our brokenness. We like to think of a little better version of ourselves than is probably true, and that truth that comes in reveals our need. But that love of God that doesn't come in retribution but comes in grace still has to be received. And when we don't receive it, it, it distorts the way we live. Jesus tells like, I'm just going to give you three quick little parables of this. The first is the parable of the talents, where these different people have different amounts of money, right? And we find out that one of them takes his talent and hides it. 
He buries it in the ground and he buries it because he goes, oh, because I knew that you, God, in this story are harsh, right? So the one that's afraid of this punishing God takes and hides what he has, fearing the retribution of God. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 this is a waste. What I want you to do is just live with this wild sort of generosity that I'm not up there keeping score over your life, but instead I'm giving you what you can so that you can invest in this world with a heart like mine, a heart that is generous. There's another parable. This one, uh, you all know the um, parable of the prodigal son, where we see that non-retributive heart of the father revealed as the son comes back in shame and despair. The son who is rejected comes back with his head down and is met by this love of this father who runs to him and forgives him. And there we see in that story the distortion on the other end, and the, the good son, the one who thinks he's done everything right. Which you realize as Jesus tells these stories, he's going, it's probably the most dangerous place you could be to be the one who thinks that they've earned it somehow, they deserve it, the good son. Who when he sees that party given to his brother and the forgiveness is, is upset by it, can't let himself come in. And see, I think these fears of God, afraid of his punishing, the harsh view of God, or, or the sort of arrogant view of ourselves, both of these have this way of breaking relationship. And the light comes in and reveals our humility. But the light also comes in and reveals God's heart and forgiveness. There's one more parable that I thought I would tell, and this is probably the most provocative of all Jesus' parables, is the one of the sheep and the goats. Do you remember this parable? Where it's this sort of end days, you know, a story that's being told here where there's kind of two lines, who's going to enter into eternal life versus consequence. And, and what you find is that, you know, this one is labeled the sheep and this one's labeled the goats, and not you guys, but I'm just... Um, for sake of illustration, everybody get in line, all the good people, all the bad people. And Jesus so cleverly says, it turns out they all get in the wrong line, right? That everybody that gets in the good person line, that look good on the outside, Jesus says, well, I don't know you guys because I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit. And then you have this other group of people that Jesus turns to and he says, oh, my people. And they're like, do we know you? And he says, no, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these brothers, you did it to me. This is interesting, right? We see right at the heart, what is God getting at? He's going, my children know my love and respond in kind. This is what it means to follow Jesus. This is what it means to be a disciple. Beloved, let us love. And when we live in that place, we are dwelling in this place of love as opposed to fear. I, uh, Henry Nouwen calls these like two different houses. Which house do you dwell in? The house of love or the house of fear? And I think sometimes we have such a distorted view of the gospel. I was reading somebody recently who was saying uh, when they were a pastor, somebody, he was a youth pastor and a Mom wanted her son to go to camp, and she was like, oh, I just hope he shows up. I just want him to get so tired that he, like, stops fighting, just walks forward on the al al when they give the altar call, just finally gives up, and then I'll know at least he's going to heaven. And you see John going, oh, no, 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 right? Like, this is so much bigger than that. This is about being invited into this place of intimacy with God. 
This is about knowing who you are as the beloved. This is about God revealing purpose and mission and vision for your life. That you become part of the blessing as you receive the blessing, you bless others. Does that make sense? I told you, you know, this idea of there's more, right? That sometimes we take these ideas and we, we get them down so small. And I think what we see here is John just getting flesh and blood on this. Henry Nouwen says this, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. The voice uttering these words sounds all through history as the voice of God's messengers, be they angels or saints. It's the voice that announces a whole new way of being, a being in the house of love, the house of the Lord. The house of love is not simply a place in the afterlife, a place in heaven beyond this world. Jesus offers this house right in the midst of our anxious world. Which is why Jesus would say, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And what does this give us, this gospel? It gives us confidence. It gives us assurance. This is the opportunity that we have today to live in that place of assured hope, right? that when we receive this love and we receive God's spirit, what comes with it is assurance. And that assurance of God's love roots us, as Paul describes, it grounds us in love. And this is what we want to do. We want to grow more and more and more into this place of confidence in the love of God. And I don't say this waving a finger at you, like, come on, be confident. It's a way of opening ourselves up to this intentionally praying that prayer, asking for more. God, give me the eyes to see. God, help me see through what's become familiar. Help me see through the things that alarm me and make me fearful. Maybe that there's not enough to provide for my future. Maybe that I'm wondering where I'm going to stay. Maybe that I'm wondering what I'm going to eat. All of these things and going, God, give me eyes to see. But as God restores that heart and that love, God, give me eyes to see the needs of others. How do I go out and meet that need? How do I go out and provide that thing, the refrigerator or whatever it is? I just love that picture of this, that these people in fear, I love Billy just sort of driving over the border. What a great visual for us. John says, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because he is so, because he is, so also are we in this world. So also are we in this world. So also are we, little church by the sea, in this world. And when we live in this place, experiencing this intimacy, scripture tells us we just come boldly before the throne. We walk right up into the presence of Jesus as these little kids who he delights in. You are his beloved. May you know that this morning. And as he is, so also are we in the world. Let us live into that every day. In a world so desperate to see and to know God, may we be accurate reflections of a love, not withholding or punishing or retributive, not hearts that hold back forgiveness, but respond with grace that not just love and convenience, but love with sacrifice. I have some questions. And the first is really just a, a, a way of imagining or thinking about your heart. And I kind of like this image. I think sometimes there's like calm on the surface and yet underneath is so much turbulence going on. What's going on under the surface of your heart? What are the deeper currents swirling around? said, how much of your life is spent in the house of love versus the house of fear? What do your actions and behaviors reveal about your trust and confidence in God's love? Where are you stressed and worried? Where are you anxious and despairing? I'm convinced we need to be praying more and more honest prayers where we come to God and say, I do believe, help my unbelief. Number two, can you imagine yourself at the foot of the cross? 
Understanding the fullness of God's love requires staring at something that is hard for us to look at. I read this quote just this morning by this guy, Martin Marty, where it says, everything in this world, everything is permitted and nothing is forgiven. And you stare at the cross and it says the very opposite of that. It comes in and it says, there, are, there is sin and there is consequence. There's brokenness and this is forgiven. And all we have to do is receive that to say yes to it. It's that thief on the cross turning to Jesus and saying, remember me when you get to your kingdom. A friend who does that is like a practice where he just says, picture yourself like there at the foot of the cross and I want you to just sort of raise your gaze. (laughs) You know, how, how high can your eyes get? And to look on that and to realize that sort of love, the power of that love, the depth of that love, for you. And lastly, who are you being called to love? And maybe more clearly, who are you resisting loving? How can you take that non-coercive love that you've received and give it to others without seeking something in return? This sort of love that turns the other cheek, this sort of love that loves those that are hard to love, How do we turn towards the world, bear the consequence with Christ as we endure the sufferings of Christ, receive his love, and then give it with full hearts? Would you stand with me? So sweet to celebrate this morning the baptisms. If you haven't accepted Christ and would like to pray, I would just encourage you, come forward. I would love to pray with you this morning. We have food out on the patio. We have a chance to hang out and enjoy each other and experience just the joy of community. I uh, do want to leave you with a blessing as you go. God would bless you and keep you. That God would make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And may God lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. God bless you. Thanks, you guys, for being here.